Okay, for our next presentation here in Saal Zuse, I'm very happy to introduce to you Sophia Kirke Forslund Statseva um, with her. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Uh, so Sophia is a computational biology researcher here in Berlin. I was about to say here in Berlin, but we're in Hamburg. Uh, in Berlin, <laughs> and we're ha really happy to uh, have Sophia with us. And she's giving us the presentation, Gut Feelings, Can We Optimize Lifestyle Diet and Medication According to Our Respective Microbiota. Sophia, your stage. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I am properly mic'd and you can hear me in the back and so on. Uh, excellent. It is very, very much an honor to speak with you and uh, this has been my first uh, visit to the Congress. I am blown away. This feels like home, this feels like my people. I will look into ways I can participate and assist this movement in whatever way I can. Anyway, enough with the gushing. Um, what am I going to talk about? Basically, so I approach my research and the research of my lab into the gut microbiome from a perspective of personalized medicine. What do I mean by that? Well, all of us want to be healthy, we want to live long, we want to thrive, we want to be happy. Uh, and there are a lot of ways in which we can fail to do that as we age, as we experience various internal and, and external perturbations. So we've developed all sorts of interventions, nutritional, medication-wise, lifestyle, to try to prevent disease, try to revert disease, try to improve the efficacy of ways of treating disease in different ways. Uh, however, none of these work consistently for everyone. Uh, anyone who's tried out a bunch of medications trying to fix something will know how difficult that can be. Anyone who's tried to lose weight will know how difficult that can be. The problem being the best tools we know of still do not work consistently in every person in most cases. So the goal of personalized prevention or personalized intervention is to try to see, can we work out what works best for a given person based on what we know about them? what we know about their life and the circumstances of their life, uh, what we know about their body and the processes going on in there, whether they are genetic or, or shaped otherwise. Uh, can we make informed conclusions based on this hideously complex system that will let us tailor what a person should eat, what drugs they should take, what interventions they should undergo in their lifestyle to be able to stay healthy for as long as possible in as many ways as possible, of course, reflecting their personal definition of, of health and disease as what's the desirable outcome for them. So this is what we want to try to achieve. And there are a few different the aspects we can draw on when we try to do this. Um, one subfield of this is the idea of personal association, which is what I'll mainly focus on in this talk. The idea being that perhaps what we eat will be processed differently in different individuals and that will lead to different outcomes on even the same diet. Is this true, and can we in that case determine what's best for a given person to eat to be able to have their body move in the direction they want? Uh, so that's a question I think that is extremely important, not only for, for sort of quality of life as we live, but also for how long our lives are. I approach this from the perspective of microbiota. Um, there are no sterile surfaces, more or less, in the world, certainly none on the surface or in the mucosal uh, components of the human body. All those surfaces are colonized by billions and billions of bacteria, the most dense uh, prevalence being in the intestines, but also elsewhere uh, <coughs> throughout the body. I'll focus primarily on the intestine here because that is most relevant for the topic here, but we are also researching other microbiomes and the interconnectedness between them. These bacterial communities uh, do involve pathogens that invade us for a while, cause trouble, and then hopefully are fought off or become dormant. Uh, sleeper invaders, uh, but most of them are either commensals or neutral, so they are can kind of helpful for us under some circumstances, or they're opportunists waiting for a moment to strike at, mostly kept down by their fellows. The typical human gut has maybe about a hundred different species of bacteria present at different concentrations, but they vary widely between different individuals. 
We may or may not get some of them already in utero, but we definitely colonized shortly after birth or during the process of birth. There's a succession, different bacteria take over, that moves forward, changes a bit during puberty, changes definitely during weaning, changes a bit during age, changes a bit with some things happening in your lifetime, such as a severe viral infection sometimes, or antibiotics treatment, etc. And it's very, very variable community between different individuals. We have co-evolved with these microbes, so they have adapted to us, we have adapted to them, even though they will work in some other species. Many human bacteria work best in humans and vice versa. Uh, others are sort of more generalists. And we have delegated a bunch of functions to them or relied on them in our evolution. We are dependent on them for training our immune system. We're dependent on them to keep some other bacteria away. So they're sort of policing their own for us, trying to be excellent to their host. And a few other sort of varying functions, including a bunch of metabolic functions and digestion functions. I am sort of on time. Good. How do we study these complex microbiomes? Well, in the old days, you'd culture stuff, look at agar plates in microscopes, but many of these bacteria cannot grow on their own. They need their friends around. Others are basically intolerant to oxygen. So what we learned to do once next generation sequencing came online and became uh, less costly than requiring like the entire budget of a small country or something for the human genome, um, is what is called metagenomic sequencing. So in the case, for example, intestinal microbiota, we typically take stool samples, they're accessible, they do not necessarily represent the small intestine super well, but it's harder to get volunteers to let us like go in with a long colonoscopy, you know, etc. Uh, we get the samples, we treat them in a way to minimize batch effects, we use sometimes automated now setups to extract bacterial DNA, put it into a sequencer, and we get out lots and lots and lots of short text strings of, of DNA that we then align, interesting computational problems around that, and use that related to our reference databases to quantify what bacteria are present, in what relative amounts, we can sometimes tell how fast they divide, we can tell what functional capacities the genes encode, and we can get a readout of the functionality and composition of a given microbiome, which we can summarize statistically in different ways. Uh, and that's basically how we try to do this in most cases when we study it now. Um, I primarily approach this from a perspective of clinically relevant microbiomes, which means analyzing samples from human donors, one way or the other. In many cases, this is a cross-sectional analysis. So for example, you'd compare, say, diabetics and non-diabetics, or old and young people, or something like that. Get the samples, quantify the microbiota, do statistical analysis to check are the differences between these groups. Uh, this is challenging in some ways because the microbiota in our guts is so much more different between individuals than it is between groups. So the between individual variability is far larger than any variability between any two conditions. We can still often find signals but it, it necessitates some interesting sort of noise correction. This is one reason why I really like longitudinal analysis instead. So you compare each person to themselves over time before and after an intervention, for example. That gives us more statistical power to achieve this. And it allows us to circumvent also some confounding influences, which I'll get back to in a moment. I will say, however, that all of this is just association mining. So we end up with... Uh, connection statistically between one state and another, we still need to prove that there's a relevant causality there. And one obstacle here comes about specifically in the human setting, because a human being is not just a body, it's a body in a life. It's a body in a life that's treated by physicians. So when someone gets sick, of course, the physician will prescribe them medications. Those medications will also change the microbiome. Or there might be indirect associations. Someone who has a certain disease might come from a background that that makes more likely, and that would also have different effects on the microbiome one way or the other. So it's hard from just the cross-sectional comparisons to tell apart what is a direct effect versus an indirect effect or a bystander. So we are working on statistical methods to get around this. Some of it is resolved through the longitudinal rather than cross-sectional setting, uh, but it remains something that has to be borne in mind when interpreting. 
Now, one thing I really find fascinating are some of these medication confounders that actually seem to be uh, potential mediators. So you might have a bacterium that's depleted in the gut of people with diabetes, but that's increased when someone takes an anti-diabetic medication. That would be an indication perhaps this is both part of the pathomechanism of the disease and something which we can intervene against with, with a medication that we can pick up statistically from mining this kind of combined omics patient data. So that's generally exciting to me at least. Uh, still, associations are what we have, and until we can prove that something works, it may be risky to put it into practice. In some rare cases, one might go directly to humans and try something, but generally that is difficult for legal and ethical reasons. I know many people feel it's also difficult for, for ethical reasons to do animal experimentation, and we're trying to minimize that as far as we can, but these are extremely complicated systems with a whole community of different living things inside another living thing from birth to death. It's very hard to reduce that to just a slice of cells, for example. So to prove that a given microbiome component, such as the presence of a bacteria or the depletion of a bacteria, causes a clinical phenotype, what we typically have to do is this kind of colonization experiment where we'll raise animals in, say, an incubator that's completely germ-free, astronaut style. Then we might take, for example, gut microbiota from someone before a treatment and after a treatment, we put it into two batches of animals that we keep apart and we see does the one get sicker than the other, for example, can we replicate a positive or negative phenotype. This demonstrates causality and after that we can typically try to move into clinical trials. Um, and this is also an interesting, potentially useful intervention that some people actually do, and it sometimes works that you put stool from one person into another person, and they might get better. It's kind of uncontrolled. It's not approved for sort of legal purposes, but there are states where it seems to work. That's a side note. That it's not a nutritional intervention per se. Um, Instead, the question I want to ask, so the sort of main point of this talk that I've been trying to lead up to is, I want to ask the question and answer it to the extent that it is as yet possible on whether or not we can use understanding of a person's gut microbiome to determine what nutrition and also what medication is good for that person for them to reach their personal health goals. Uh, and, uh, there are a few ways that we know that this can work. I'm not going to talk so much about medications, but there are a few examples I want to mention. For example, there are a bunch of drugs that will be degraded by the acid in the stomach, so you make them in a modified, more resilient form. They pass through the stomach as a pro-drug and then rely on the presence of bacteria in the intestines to be converted back into active form. Now, some people have less of those bacteria for that particular formulation and will have a lower concentration of the drug and lower efficacy. This is one example where knowing someone's gut microbiota might help in deciding what medication to prescribe. Other similar cases exist for the heart medicine digoxin, for example, for the um, type diabetes medication acrobose. We know of bacteria present in some people, but not others that degrade the medication so that it doesn't work as well in those people either. Again, something that's good to know. Then there are exciting cases like for some psychiatric medications and for statins that lower blood lipids, where some gut microbiome compositional states make the drug work worse or better. Uh, we don't always know how. We are trying to explore that further. That's another example. We, again, we're getting closer and closer to some of this. And then there are these super exciting cases where a drug might actually change the gut microbiota and that contributes to better health, or in some cases contributes to side effects. We showed this a couple of years ago for the most common anti-diabetic drug metformin, for example, that increases carriages on bacteria that promote metabolic health, and it increases the carriage in some people or bacteria that may be driving some of the side effects, like bloating, etc. So there may be ways of optimizing this, of force multiplying it by targeting the bacteria directly or by targeting it in tandem, and it might be that it's possible to prime people for optimal efficacy or to choose medications. These are all isolated examples, however. We will learn more of those 
by studying larger and larger patient cohorts where we have gut microbiome data, medication track records, and outcome of treatment. If we do this, we will be mining this for more things that can become directions and guidelines, but so far, it's only known for a few cases. I anticipate that this can be very useful in the future at some point. Uh, going, however, to the uh, nutritional, the sort of key nutritional area, I want to introduce the concept of postprandial surges. So after we eat something, uh, we end up having these blood sugar spikes, right? So also blood lipid spikes. Uh, this is heavily clinically relevant, even though what's usually used for diagnosis of diseases is more often the fasting glucose or fasting lipid levels. Uh, the spikes will represent a substantial part of our day, and the spikes might reach far more dangerous levels. Too much blood sugar, too much lipid, etc. all these are dangerous. All these make the body sort of overreact and try to sort of overadapt. Sugar can actually be toxic to some areas and membranes, and so there are lots of weird associations that has good reasons to try to curb these spikes if we can, even though we still need to explore the epidemiology to know exactly when it matters the most. Uh, what is known, of course, and this is from a study that I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide, just shows that uh, for the same, for different food, let's say the same person might have very different spikes. What they did, however, and these are colleagues in Israel who were doing this for 800 people. They had blood uh, glucose sensors on the arm, you know, these ones that have become also possible in the last few years, which is why this is now possible to do. All this has been possible through wearable sequencing tech and computational technologies. Um, you can see that the same person might eat, uh, no, two different people might eat the same meal and have really opposite blood sugar spikes. It's not necessarily common, but it does happen. So what they did was they were able to show that they can, in principle, predict the postprandial surges of blood glucose in this population, also transfer some of it to another population, sort of training and test data. Uh, and they can trace some of this to uh, either the gut microbiome, to the meal, or to the combination of the meal of the gut microbiome. The question is what fraction are, are of those, because of course what's just there for anyone eating this meal, that's not so useful for personalizing, and what's there for just the microbiome, regardless of what you eat, is also doesn't affect what you, eat, what you should eat, it affects how you should change your microbiome, but the combination is relevant. Some follow-up studies were done in the UK and the US, and they still haven't proven that this always works, that this always works super strongly, but we have gone with an approximate idea that maybe 20% of the postprandial spike variability is derivable to the specifics of the meals alone. About 15% is attributable to the microbiome, and there's about 5% that's combinatorial, which would actually guide you. So, okay, your microbiome indicates you should eat this or that. This is still ongoing work. They are doing more trials. I'm sure they'll put something out on the market, but there is nothing yet where we sort of know that this will have a major impact for your life if you do it, and here it's available. So this is, again, something that's gonna come up, uh, and it's a little bit of an open question how often it's important, but even if it's just a small fraction for the population as a whole, there might still exist some fraction of people for which it really does have a lot of impact. So I'm quite hopeful this too can be useful. Um, finally, I'm interested in ways in which we can alter the microbiome through things, uh, nutritional interventions of different kind. And this is relevant because we have identified a number of associations between microbiome and health using the methods I told you before, with cross-section, longitudinal code comparisons. And in many cases, they have also been validated as causal in animal models, so we can show that we can induce some diseases by putting stool from a sick versus healthy person into different groups of mice, meaning we have a pretty good grounds for believing they are also part of why some people have a higher risk of some diseases. This, these are not radical risk changes, these are increases of risk, but those add together. Uh, and it's also a lot of general mechanisms that have one effect in one person, one effect in another. A lot of these disease associations that you see are traceable to sort of underlying component pathologies, increases in blood pressure, increases in systemic inflammation, increases in blood lipids. Uh, 
leaky gut, so increasing permeability where bacteria go out into circulation and trigger inflammation, various systemic inflammation processes, the immune system, learning maladaptive behaviors with traumatized immune system starting to develop autoimmunity, etc. All these various things where hopefully the more we know, the more things we can target and overall we can decrease these risks uh, by decisions we can take. So <clears throat> when we know that a gut microbiome is associated with disease, how can we try to change it? Well, one thing we do know is that... Mm, nice. Um, it certainly does respond to diet, both habitual long-term diet and acute immediate changes in diet. And we've got data on this. It's not entirely uh, consistent, but there's clearly an effect, and the more data we collect, the more exactly we can start to determine what is true in what person. Beyond this, more specifically, beyond this sort of example of what I just said, is sort of macronutrient composition change, like eat more fiber, eat less cholesterol, eat more protein, eat less uh, sugar, eat more... Uh, what else do we eat more of? Hmm. Vegetables. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you get it. Uh, my point being, that certainly has an effect. It might not be an individualized effect so much. Like, it might be something that all of us should do uh, to some degree. But where there is an individualized problem, we can also use various biotic approaches. And by that, I mean, on one hand, Prebiotics, so taking indigestible fibers of different kinds. We can't digest them, or bacteria can, inulin, uh, collagen, etc. Various, various things that are sometimes converted into helpful anti-inflammatory metabolites, sometimes act in different ways, but what they also do is that they make the bacteria that likes these for their nutrition multiply and become a larger fraction of the gut community. So we can give food for the bacteria we want to. We can subsidize the bacteria we prefer to prebiotics. Probiotics is adding live bacteria, so yogurts and other forms. This certainly can do a lot of things. We don't know yet exactly when they will stay resident or when you have to keep on taking them transiently. There might be sort of complicated Core, uh, corner cases, but it's definitely one, one instrument in this, and it's very clear to understand how it works. And then there's what has been called postbiotics, so things that are made by bacteria, like the products that they make when they digest these fibers. Uh, we benefit from those, but also other bacteria that are friends of those first fermenters may like that for their nutrition, and they will increase in numbers, and this is another way to change the gut community. And this is basically why fermented foods generally seem to be good for us. How is this personalizable, aside from sort of recognizing you might have a bad starting point and want to change it? Well, um, there's been some interesting studies in giving people high-fiber diet or prebiotic diets, including some things from traditional Chinese medicine and various other sort of interesting plant compounds that have been perhaps underexplored. Uh, they definitely work. They improve metabolic health in the randomized control trials that they've done in. But they do so better for the people who have more of the bacteria at baseline that can benefit from degrading those compounds and multiply. So the more bacteria you already have who will uh, have a chance to gain dominance or at least increase in number if you give them these prebiotics, the better are your chances of achieving also overall health impact from a treatment like this, like reduced inflammation. Uh, however, even if we find that, sorry, you don't actually have so many fecal bacterium present inside that could degrade this fiber baseline, you are not screwed because we have ways of increasing that as well. Uh, one study we did a while back took uh, hypertensive metabolic syndrome patients in the south of Berlin and <clears throat> randomly put them into two groups. Both started a metabolic, no, Mediterranean diet, high fiber Mediterranean diet, known to reduce hypertension. But half of them we randomized into first fasting for a week. And it turns out this primed them. So the fasting changed the microbiome composition in such a way that they were better able to uh, take up uh, the changes from this diet change and thereby reducing inflammation substantially more. 
More to the point, and this is super relevant, the people for whom this treatment really made a difference were the ones who didn't have those bacteria in very high abundance as a baseline. So we can identify those who lack particular commensals and in some cases a treatment like fasting, and this also actually works for intermittent fasting, uh, that can change their microbiome to better be able to benefit from a given nutritional intervention and we can see downstream effects on the population of immune cells and so on for how this works. Uh, in principle, we can predict this <clears throat> from what's available uh, in these measurements. We did machine learning on, for example, the immune cell population that worked well. Still, this was like 75 people. Uh, it's still a large study <clears throat> by the standards of this particular subfield. Uh, but after we did this, I looked up what has other people done in similar things where they put people on some kind of fasting diet and measured their microbiome before and after. And there's been some studies, but many of them, quite few individuals. Uh, we do see that the bacteria that we were seeing as the main drivers of the improvement, and these are this kind that ferments fiber into short-chain fatty acids, particularly butyric acid, which is calming the immune system down, and propionic acid, which we've shown reduces blood pressure. Um, we see those most consistently, but there's a lot of difference between studies in how often each signal comes up. Many of these other earlier studies were smaller still, uh, but this is this consistently a problem because what we're trying to do is we're trying to discover. We're not validating hypotheses. So if we are not to cheat with our statistics, we have to correct for the fact that we're testing every possible hypothesis. So statistical power is generally low. Uh, and this frustrates me. I feel that sometimes it looks like you're looking at entirely different beasts when you're looking into these microbiome associations of different diseases or different treatments. Like, how can this hang together? How can this be part of the same whole? Uh, and the main thing I, I, I have to conclude is that at the ways we currently study it, we are looking only at a small part at a time, and we see that part only dependent on the specifics of our study and the specifics of our study population and what kind of is closest to the surface there. So the hope would be that with more data and seeing it from more angles and integrating that and also finding out how our particular viewpoint biases what we see, uh, especially in meta-analysis and sort of pooling data together and actually pooling the raw data together, the sequence reads from movie studies, not just the, uh, not just the sort of results, uh, we might be able to get closer and get a clearer view of an underlying theory of host microbiome symbiosis and it's, it's possible modification to nutritional means. So what are the obstacles for us? I'll, I'll say that this is not just true for fasting and the microbiome, this is true for any kind of omics biology, any kind of omics medicine, anything that tries to look at the human body with all its environmental and host complexities using high throughput methods. Replication is difficult. And it shouldn't be. We need to get around that. We need to be more sa secure so we can actually get healthcare providers to use the recommendations we make. We need uh, to be able to prove it to health insurances and so on. So there are a few hurdles that I would like to overcome, or I believe could help us overcome this current uncertainty on the specifics of the mechanisms by which, for example, nutritional intervention into the microbiome works. The main problem is lack of data. This is actually not big data. I mean, it's big data in the level that we have millions and millions and millions and billions of bacteria from each person or billions of sequencing reads from, from anyone's transcriptomics experiment. But we typically don't have more than a few hundred of patients for which we have high resolution omics data. This is because these techniques are, are expensive. But people are hacking these platforms and building cheaper sequences, sequencers and building cheaper mass specs, etc. So we're getting there. And hopefully that also means that the uh, restriction of these things for diagnostic purposes to just posh uh, research hospitals might expand and we might get it all in, in, in wider scopes. Also ways of sort of overcoming logistics problems. We're beginning to get to a point where we can send samples by post, for example, and still have them preserved. Um, there's another problem, however, in that my view is that with humans being so utterly complicated, the only way we'll be able to sort of get across this 
elephant problem, if you will, is to be able to observe humans, not just when we recruit them for cohorts, but every time they interact with the healthcare system, consensually, of course. Uh, we need some way of getting omics data from the healthcare system regularly and medical uh, track records. Like, we tried this medication, it didn't work. We tried this medication, it didn't work. Here are properties of this person that might be associated with it. This is a major integrity problem and a logistics problem and a legal problem. And there's been super interesting talks earlier on the conference on sort of hurdles and issues in some ways of trying to get around that. And I think this is a dialogue that I'm hoping we'll keep on working on, so we'll find some ways of accountably, safely, effectively let all of us contribute when we choose to for research purposes with the data generated by our actual day-to-day -day healthcare, or entirely bottom-up, like trace your step counters or your glucose monitors and upload it to some crowdsourced tool. But this is legislative work also, so I'm, I'm hoping to get ideas on Congress. Some already emerged on how this could be improved. Uh, another area that's a main problem in this kind of replication circumstances is when we're trying to put together what's been published before on different things, because there's a lot of articles that go out there, and a lot of them are garbage. But even when they're not, in many cases, they don't share the data in any standardized way. If they share the data, it's all free text in abstract, sometimes hidden between paywalls, so we can't even get to the papers. So this ties into the wider like open science movement and the possibilities of making the work that actually went into so many people's PhD theses out there, etc., available and useful for application uh, and for pooling together. I think one of the problems here is lack of standardization, uh, especially of medical records or of omics records or details of experiments. There are a bunch of attempts are like, let's make a new standard, let's make this standard and everyone should use it. And sure, that's good when it happens if people do that, but people are selfish and want attention and they will use their own weird shit because that's more fun for them. Well, maybe we are somewhere, but until we do, I am very curious now uh, on the possibility of using something like the large language models or similar types of machine learning to look at what human beings have published and to compile it in a systematic way. So from the <clears throat> perspective of taking like the equivalent of me telling a master student, read this paper, download the data, and put it into the same format as those other articles we have for the metadata file. If I could ask like, my, my chat GPT assistant or whatever to do this on a systematic scale, we could overcome a lot of these issues. And I think that would be super interesting. I'd be curious, again, during the Congress, what ideas might come up to do this. Um, what else did I see as a main problem? I think those were kind of my main problems at that level, but there's also another level, and that's the purely scientific one, because I think this is not all that's there. I think the elephant is more complex in the sense that perhaps there isn't a simple biology where this thing does that under all circumstances. It might be this thing or that thing or that thing to get a balancing by this thing. If this thing is not in place, that determines the actual outcome and the different studies will have sampled different populations where this or that factor is or isn't there. So we need some way of representing from the data that we do have and the data that we will get these kind of oppositional forces or these kind of balancing forces. I suspect there is some way of looking at these data matrices where we would see this as some sort of latent structure that would show more consistent signal across data sets. So this is something I would love to work more on and ideally find more people who are interested in trying to solve. I'm sure you guys know so much more mathematics and computer science than I do, so like, I'm hoping for ideas. Hit me up later. Uh, and similarly, I guess this is kind of the same idea that a healthy microbiome seems to look different between cohorts from different places, different ages. Maybe the truth is for you don't actually need this or that. You need either this, this, or this, and then something from this, and then enough from this, and avoid all these things. But what we have are count data. We have 
233,000 copies of this bacterium in this gut sample, as opposed to in this gut sample. Count data behaves weirdly. I believe it should be possible to mine some sort of assembly rules from that kind of data when there's enough data assembled. I don't know how, but I would love to find people who have ideas and explore them, because that could again perhaps give us sort of more transferable, consistent signatures. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to go through. So let me again thank you guys for listening and you guys for inviting me. This was absolutely glorious. I uh, adore you. Uh, I want to thank, of course, all the people that I have worked with in some of the work we hear about came from me, our various collaborators, the various participants in both studies, also the colleagues and rivals elsewhere that have done great work that I have also presented. Uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from, no, not inspiration, a lot of artwork that was taken from the Moyashimon anime. You should go watch it. It's an absolutely amazing anime about microbiomes. It's also got a transition plot that's really, really well done, which I know several of you will appreciate as much as I did. And I use some illustrations from Adventure Time. Finally, uh, we have an international PhD program that people can apply to. Uh, if you do apply there, and you're successful, you could do a project with me about something like this. Or if you're not collaborate with us in any other way, contact us at any point. Hit me up at the Congress, hit me up after, and we'll see where we take it. Thank you. Great. So we have uh, only a couple of minutes time. Um, we will do it as follows because people are already lining up. We are doing uh, Internet 1, 2. So Internet is first. Uh, the Internet is interested to know your opinion on uh, systems where people share a biome sample to be implement implanted in another patient. I know there are attempts at making stool banks of like healthy donors. Uh, what's not known yet is to what extent this should be personalized. There's some indications from a study done in, by my postdoc lab and their collaborators at some point that diet shapes the overall structure, but immune system shapes the fine structure. If the latter is true, you might have benefits changing the overall structure but not the fine structures of the particular strains, unless you choose a donor that's related or that you have been around for a long time, so you have some immune tolerance for. But we really don't know this yet. It needs more exploration. So please keep making these banks. Please keep trying it out. And please store that data, and we can try to mine it and see if we can learn more on when it will versus will not work. So for everybody who's leaving, please be quiet doing so. So mark for one, next question. I have a question regarding some specific research on microbiome regarding the low carb, high fat, or sometimes called metabolic uh, diet that is known to reduce the glucose levels, or like not to have them, and also the insulin levels that influence mm -hmm. diabetes 2 case, cardiovascular disease, and in particular, I would be interested in the effect on the microbiome if you want some research. Is there anything you can tell in short? <laughs> there has been research. I need to read up more on the detail. Um, the low carb thing here is probably more a shift in which carbs, so avoiding sort of simple carbs. I don't think the fibrous would be a problem, for example. Uh, there is some risk of high fat, even in a low carb, high fat diet under some circumstances, but I think that in turn might be mitigated by the change in carbs leading to a change in inflammatory status and therefore reducing intestinal permeability. It certainly has empirical support and uh, there's been an unnecessary fear of fat long in dietary track records, but important thing if you do this is consider which carbs and what fat. Uh, other than that, there's definitely microbiome associations, but I don't have it off the top of my head which they are. We've tried it a bunch of things. Uh, happy to discuss it further and sort of guide it in some direction. Thank you. Okay, Mark von two quick, concise. We're running out of time. Um, do you see any difference between supplementing vitamins with uh, pills or just ingesting them with the food that you uh, choose to eat? We haven't tested this, and I'm not aware if there's literature. There might be. 
There probably is, but it's not something I looked into. It's a good question, and we should start tracking that more closely in course we do recruit. Okay, I see interest is very high. So, uh, Sophia, where can people find you here in Congress? Uh, I'll be hanging around here. I'll be hanging around tomorrow. Uh, you could... Uh, da, 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 da. Have I have way? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can hit me up on, like... Uh, I mean, Google me and you'll find like my uh, usernames. I'm no longer on Twitter, but I still use the same username there and on Telegram or Signal, etc. I'm sort of at Inanna underscore Analytica on all platforms I can be. You can message me or like, uh, do we have deck numbers? <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, we don't have deck numbers yet, but we will. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. Super happy to speak with you guys. Thanks, Sophia.